So Professor Donald W. Schaffner, he's a food microbiologist at Rutgers University, conducted a funded two-year study back in 20, 2016 to determine the validity of the five-second rule. Okay, so you know the five-second rule that if you drop a piece of food or something that is particularly tasty, you have five seconds to pick it up and it won't pick up germs. Now, I don't know if anybody actually believes in the five-second rule, uh, or at least I didn't think anybody did, uh, but it is a convenient way to eat that chip that you're just not ready to say goodbye to yet. Uh, but because of uh, uh, enough people that had different debates on this, uh, Professor Schaffner, got uh, funding to do this two-year study, and uh, he tested four services. He tested stainless steel, ceramic tile, wood, and carpet. And he tested four different foods, uh, cut watermelon, bread, buttered bread, and straw strawberry gummies, okay? Uh, he then, uh, the researchers tested four contact times. So one item they would drop for less than a second, one item for five seconds, one for 30 seconds, and one for 300 seconds. They were dropped from a height of five inches onto surfaces treated with a specific bacterium. So a total of 128 possible combinations of surface, food, and seconds were replicated 20 times each yielding a, a, a test sample of 2,560 times to determine, and I'm sorry to break it to you if you have held on to this, that there is absolutely no validity to the five second rule, okay? Which is something that probably most people uh, knew and it's awesome that we funded that to uh, make sure. But I, I love that that is one of those things where, uh, you know, it's now determined, it's now clear, and I'm sure someone somewhere believed wholeheartedly in that, that it took time for bacteria to crawl onto food or whatever it is, and, and really held by that, and uh, now uh, they're proven. And, and it's an important thing to think about because sometimes we trust in something, we trust in a bit of information because it's just the way it always has been. Or we trust in something because somebody that, you know, we like or that we, we trust that person. They've said it and we just kind of adopted it and believed it until there's a real reason for something else to come along. And, uh, uh, but sometimes it's important to listen for the warnings that say, well, maybe that's not true. Speaking of warnings, I don't know if you have ever, pretty much anybody who's ever driven through any kind of mountainous region, you have probably seen some signs like this, right? Falling rocks, uh, or maybe they just specifically lay it out like this and just say, falling rocks, the next one there. Um, watch for falling rocks. Now, I want to be honest with you. I have never in my life actually seen a falling rock while driving on the freeway. I have probably seen 500 different times this sign driving through the mountains. And interestingly enough, I don't doubt them. I don't see those signs and think, well, that's politically motivated or, you know, or something or think like, well, you know, that's just a rumor mill or, or myths. When I see signs that say falling rock, even though I've never in my life actually seen a falling rock, I believe there is a valid reason for that to be there. And sometimes you can actually see the results of the falling rock on the ground. Yet sometimes when we start to talk about the dangers of the devil, or the evil or, uh, that, that, that encroaches on us, or the topic that we're hitting on today of false prophets, it's very easy to dismiss it as, ah, that's too spiritual, or oh, now we're talking about some chaps, it's a little like for the super spiritual crowd, that's not really my thing, and so I'm gonna kind of shut it off. But for whatever, whatever reason, in this setting that we have talked about week after week, this time where Jesus gathered his would-be followers and, and is laying out them the guidelines, the rules for living a life that represents him if we choose to follow him, there's this moment as he's winding this sermon down where he kind of leans in, looks everyone in the eye and says, I want you to understand something. We need to be wary of false prophets. There was something important enough, something he knew enough about the nature of, of people in his time, the nature of people in our time, that there would need to be of all these great instructions and guidelines for living, this manifesto for life that Jesus laid out in this Sermon on the Mount setting, that are here towards the end of it, he needs to make sure that we hear his warning. I want you to understand, you need to be weary 
of false prophets. Now, if you picked up on this, I, I, am, I tend to be a, a positive preacher. I mean, I, I, if I see something said, even if it's in the negative, I like to look at it from the other side. Not that I'm avoiding topics, but I'm always trying to find like, well, what is the thing we can do in that rather than harp on the negative side of that? Well, there really isn't much of a, ne- uh, of a, a spin on this. This is just one of those warnings that we need to tackle head on and talk about. What does that really mean? What does it mean in our day and age? I mean, do we really deal with false prophets like they uh, dealt with in this time? Is it really something that we have to be weary of? And I very much think it is. It might look a little different than what it did in the first century, but it certainly is. So let's start by reading just these few verses in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20, and just unpack this a little bit this morning. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way that they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Now at the outset, there is always this little caveat that we have to throw out there. Anytime we talk about our actions, anytime we talk about doing the good works that we need to do, it needs to be stated we're not talking about earning our way into heaven. We're not talking about if I do enough good works, if I do enough good actions, then I'm, that's done. That is a done deal in Christ and what he did on the cross. What this is, is the reflection of Christ in us. This is the way that we live out our life. And this is, as he's talking about here, this is the way that we identify in ourselves and in one another what's really going on under the surface. Back again to this theme that Jesus has hit on again and again and again, the whole idea of what's going on under the hood, what's in our heart, because that's the stuff that is going to come out. But this warning in this, at the front of it, that we have to watch out, we have to be careful for these false prophets that would lead us astray. It's the same theme that Peter picks up in his letter, 1 Peter 5.8. He simply says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil, He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We've mentioned that a couple times through this. This is one of these things that we happen to believe in very much so, in a very real devil who is looking to rob you and I of the great life that that Christ wants for us here on earth and certainly in eternity. That's his role. That's his job. And this is a huge part of this. See, I've always known, and we've always, this is not rocket science, that the devil really has two major tactics. The first is to get us to just not buy into this child story that's the whole Christianity thing. Like, it's just, a, you know, it's been around a long time, it's outdated, it's, you know, it's a children's thing, it's something we tell our kids to keep them in line, all these things. And many of us in our adult life bought into that and thought, you know what, you're right, I've grown up, I've grown up past that, that was child stuff, I'm out of there. But thankfully... God is a pursuing God, and he continues to pursue us in his absolute unending love through people around us, through circumstances, and he does manage to reach us in that. And that that constant pursuit is just an incredible part of his grace, because if it were me, I'd be like, one and done. Sorry, I did my part. You're out. But he continues to pursue us, so we do find him. But when we do find him, the devil turns to tactic number two. And tactic number two is this very thing. It's then to to mislead us with false doctrines or false prophets. People that sound good and sound holy, now that we're in this vibe and we're buying into the spiritual things, and we understand that that there is spiritual warfare and and that there's the Word of God and that there's this way we need to live our life. And when we hear someone that sounds pro that and they, they sound like they know what they're talking about and they can quote some scripture, suddenly we're all in and many times he'll use that to mislead us down a road that frankly uh, we need to really be cautious about going because this is the exact idea of what he's talking about here. These false prophets dressed 
in sheep's clothing. Very dangerous thing. So let's just talk about this in a little different way this morning. First of all, let's define a false prophet. He's given us this huge warning, and really it is simply this. Probably the best definition would come out of the, in the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, says basically someone who claims to speak for God but doesn't. God says anybody who's speaking says they're speaking for me but not speaking for me, that's a false prophet. And he goes on to say, you'll know this because they'll credit something to me and then it won't happen. If I say something's going to happen, it's going to happen kind of a thing. So, uh, so that's really simply what a false prophet is. Someone who speaks, uh, says, or claims to speak for God, but doesn't. In the New Testament, there are some warnings about this. It continues, not just here in Matthew. It's spread all the way throughout because this is a major problem. So let me just read some of these verses, if you wouldn't mind. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teachings and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago and their destruction will not be delayed. And you can think about even in, in our lives and history and those in the name of, of religion or in the name of Christianity that, have, uh, that mirror a lot of these things. And that they're just real. Every generation has had to deal with folks that mirror that passage. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. Now that is a huge warning. Now before we go any further, I just want to make clear. I mean, is that saying you shouldn't trust your pastor, you shouldn't trust your chaplain? Well, you got to take into consideration verses like 2 John 1.20 that says, well, that is why Jesus said, those called as under shepherds of my flock have earned their pay and have been given authority to interpret the mysteries of my word. So maybe we shouldn't challenge our pastors and, okay, listen, that is a lie. That's not a real Bible verse, all right? That there is no 2 John 1.20. It's, it ends with 15. So yes, it is talking about your pastors and your chaplains, all right? I'm not trying to undermine myself here, but the point is in this verse in 1 John 4.1, Dear friends, don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. Anytime we put our pastors, our teachers, our, our chaplains on such a high pedestal that if they say it, it's, it's golden, it's rule, we're walking down a dangerous road. Now that doesn't mean we challenge every single thing that is said, but it does mean we should be looking into this. And I know we rip through a lot of verses and it's just really not always possible to track. And that's why we post a lot of them up here so that we can track it. But at the very least, we should be jotting that down. Going home. See, church doesn't just end. Our, our journey is not just this, this, these few minutes we have together on a Sunday morning. We should take that stuff. Go home. Read those verses for ourselves in a translation that speaks to us the most and, and really dive into that. And if we come up with some questions, to not be afraid to ask those questions. And if we see something in there that just seems like, I understand what chap said, or I understand what my pastor said, but I am reading this and this doesn't seem to be what it says. It's possible that I, you know, there's some things that maybe I can learn and, and I, I see why it does say that, but it's possible the pastor or chaps or whoever was wrong. And we need to test that. We need to make sure. And again, there's a line of, of not just having a, a, a distrusting spirit, but we shouldn't just ever assume. We shouldn't stop looking into our Bible. We shouldn't stop challenging. We always, this we can trust. The Word of God we can trust. It has gone through every manner of test. And, and uh, we can trust what is in here. And if somebody says something that is counter to this, well, that should put off some sort of uh, alarm at some point. And it is something that we should always be journeying through. We should always be checking. So because of the fact that that, that is very much a reality, um, that there are false prophets. But going beyond that, let's talk then about the tactics of a false prophet. We've hit on that a little bit. That sometimes it's to sound close enough to good. It sounds pretty, pretty scriptural. And, and then something, some claims are made along with that. There's some other things. And right there, I talked about it in that first verse, 
Verse 15, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but they're really vicious wolves. First of all, we need to understand that false prophets or false teachers or however we call it, they tend to come to us. We don't have to go looking for them. We don't have to go on a big search because many times they're going to show up. Now, in the first century, they would litter. They were showing up in the workspaces, in the town little uh, centers. They were showing up at houses. That's probably less the case now, but perhaps um, on TV, on the Internet, on our Twitter feed, the books we read. I mean, they're interwoven in all of that. And just because someone's in print, just because someone has a blog, just because someone has a lot of followers, that doesn't mean that we can trust everything that is said. And a lot of times, that's where this stuff starts to, uh, uh, to go a little awry. That's where this stuff is coming out. So they do come to us, and there's a million means in which that can come to us today. And they come, second of all, in clever disguises, as it talked about there. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, again, that's not really a, we don't deal with that. Not a ton of us are shepherds, and that doesn't maybe meet us. But what is a modern-day sheep? Uh, uh, you know, it might, might be some hugely harmless-sounding, socially acceptable thing. Uh, 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 you know, they might look educated. They might look very socially aware. They might look very responsible. Uh, they might care about certain causes that we care about. Uh, they're going to look and sound attractive. Otherwise, it's not, it's not. But, but the fact is, is they... Jesus is warning, they're going to come very cleverly disguised. And so we have to be wary of those things. Just because they're speaking in a way that appeals to us, we have to be careful. We know that false prophets will come at opportune times. This was an issue that Jesus endured when, when he fasted at the beginning of this, this book that we've been working through, Matthew. When he fasted for 40 days in the desert, it was at the end of that 40 days, remember, that the devil then showed up. And the devil was using scripture to try and entice him and lead him away from what he was called to do. It was at that moment, uh, at a very opportune time, that he began to tempt him with things. Tempt him with, I will give you authority over this. I will let you do this. And every time, Jesus had to come back with uh, stronger biblical truth to refute that. But we don't call it the temptation of Jesus because it wasn't really tempting. It was tempting. It was tr attractive enough that it was tempting to Jesus to buy into it. But obviously, thankfully, he did not. And so we need to understand that, it, that, you know, when we look on Facebook or whatever and we see the really dumb stuff, that's not the stuff that we really have to worry about. It's the stuff that sounds really good, but it just isn't quite Scripture. Or it just counters the Bible just a little bit. But man, it sounds really good. That's the stuff that we have to be very careful of. And in times, maybe where there's a lot of social unrest going on and someone is saying something sounds so good, but suddenly something's getting placed in there that just doesn't add up to the whole thing. So it'll come at opportune times. They will also come with very good sounding false doctrine. As we mentioned, with just enough scripture in there that it just kind of sounds right. One of those false doctrines is one that we have fallen for again, every generation since the time, time of Christ, and that's the false doctrine of man. There is this long-standing debate that continues to go on in the world that basically wrestles with the question, is mankind, are we born good, and society and people kind of make us not good, or are we born bad, evil, and, and we need something to move us out of that? And again, in our day today, it is not a popular thing to say that we are born bad. We love to blame everything that, that leads us astray. Bad parenting, a, a bad environment, uh, you know, we didn't get certain tools that other people have, whatever. There's a million excuses for why we go bad. But if we would just leave each other alone, if we would stop messing with each other, if we would stop being bad parents, stop being bad this, stop being bad that, well then the world would be just fine. We're the ones who are messing it up, and probably to a degree, there's a lot of truth in that, but it is not true. Because if it were true, it would make everything that Christ did on the cross meaningless. It means we can do the work that Christ did for us. It means we could do it ourselves. And as cool and great and modern and, and responsible as all that sounds, it's just not true. Well, at least, at the very least, let me just say it this way. It is counter to the Word of God. 
So a person is more than welcome to believe that truth, but they just need to understand that that belief is going to be at odds with the Word of God. Because the Word of God is very clear that we are, as is said in many places, we are, uh, uh, you know, Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. We talked about some of the other Romans passages last week that we've all sinned, we all fall short of the glory of God, but that we all have this, this thing that needs redeemed. And it's important to understand that it's not just about um, the environment that we're in, but there is this issue of us as mankind. And that is the whole story of Adam and Eve, that God gave mankind in that way through Adam the right to choose to be with him or to do our own thing. And mankind, all of us, chose to do our own thing. And that is why there is a huge problem. And the doctrine of man would say, no, if you just be good enough, don't let people mess with you, you're going to be in good shape. That's a huge problem. So how are we to know? How are we to know and to be able to stay away from these things? Well, this is what dives in. He continues here in this Matthew 7 passage, verse 17 through 18. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So, to kind of bring this all together, we need to talk about the fruit of a false prophet or the fruit that we see, the things like to be aware that, that when we talk about the, the, the fruit of a false prophet, we're going to be able to identify in the character or the actions of this person or, or the, where this teaching is leading. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21 says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear and these things are listed. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and, and sins like these. Now that is not to say that if, if you ever done one of these things, that you are then a false prophet. That, that's not what that is saying, because then we're all in a bunch of trouble. All right. What it is saying is that if the teaching, if the character of this teaching if the character of this person that we are following and listening to is promoting these things or, or is leading to these things. And you don't have to look around very hard to find religious teachings and, and Christian teachings even that do have the aim of, of quarreling and, and selfish ambition and dissension and, and division and all these things. We need to understand that those are not things from the Spirit of God. And we have to be very cautious. We have to be aware when we see those things, when we see that character in the person that we're listening to, or we see that character in the, the sum of the teaching of what we're receiving. Those should be big red flags because those are the fruits of a false prophet. And so we need then to talk about what is the fruit of the Spirit of God? How do we count it? What is it that we're looking for? What should the teachings of the Word of God lead to? And it's these things that even if you weren't raised in the church, maybe you have heard talked about as the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, through 23, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that are the, the, the fruit that comes out of being rooted in Christ, rooted in the Word of God. Again, sometimes we do these backwards and we think, if I can produce these things in my life, well then that will earn me Christ or that will somehow uh, align me enough to God that I'll be good to go. If I can do enough of this list, then I'm good. That's not what it's saying. It's saying if we align ourselves with Christ, if we are allowing the Holy Spirit to be in us and flow out through us, well, these are the things that will come out. So if we're ever watching a teaching or, or, or observing a, 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 you know, a, a, a teaching of someone or a, the character of a person, these are the things that we want to be watching for. Does this lead to love, to joy, to peace, to patience, to kindness, to goodness, to faithfulness, to gentleness, to self-control? When we're testing the Spirit as we're asked to, those are the things that we should be looking for. These are the biblical traits of the Spirit of God. We should use these traits to test others that we're listening to and we're allowed to speak into our lives. And again, it's not saying if someone isn't perfect in these, they have no right to speak. We're, we're talking about the overall character 
of the teaching in the person. But we should also use these to test ourselves. How many are, are is, the, is the things that I am allowing to speak into my life, are they producing more of these kind of fruit? Or are they producing more of that first list that we read? And if, they, if they're more, producing more of the first fruit, we need to change what we're inputting. We need to change what we're allowing to speak into our lives. Because we need to continue to direct ourselves to the ones that will continue to push in the Word of God, the teachers that are teaching the Word of God, so that it will result in more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, and more self-control. We don't have to create those items. We have to draw close to God, and He will create those items in us. Our goal is to be inching away from the, the first list, and inching closer to this second list. That's what this journey is about. That's certainly where it needs to go. That's what the whole process that we're trying to do is we're just leaving that other list behind, moving towards this as we allow more of the Holy Spirit to reign in our lives. Let me invite the worship team to come up and close us and invite you to pray with me. Father, Lord, um, we are aware this morning. We are aware that... uh, Sometimes, maybe unintentionally, many times intentionally, um, Lord, that there are those who would lead us astray. That we know that there is a very real enemy who is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for our souls to devour, to pull us away from the life that you have for us. Father, I ask that this morning we would be acutely aware of that. That we would honestly observe what we are allowing to speak into our lives that we would honestly, honestly observe uh, who we are listening to and how we are testing it. Lord God, and that you would challenge us this morning. If it's been a long, long time since we've actually been in your word and allowed you to speak to us, that, Lord, we would be challenged to dive back into that and make that a discipline in our lives. Father, that we would, with a, in a spirit of grace and love, that we would test all of the things that we hear. And that we would be sure that um, it is you that is speaking into our lives. We want to see more of your fruit in us as we draw closer to you. So thank you for that invitation. Thank you for the constant invite that we can come and uh, just turn from wherever we are moving and move right back into your arms. We embrace that this morning. We take it. We celebrate it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, with that, would you stand with me and let's close out with one final song of celebration before uh, Dave comes and closes us.